about you being comfortable. Okay, right, should we go? Right. Okay, this, um, I'm going to be talking, let's go back. I'm going to be talking about this um, emotional well-being of staff stuff, which we've been looking at for the past three or four years. And uh, this is now uh, a funded research project. Uh, so special thanks to NIHR who've given us the money. And uh, the, an acronym that we put together is the, uh, the STRAW project, Staff Resilience and Wellbeing Project. And this involves um, uh, myself, uh, uh, Nick Gore uh, from Tizard Centre, um, Nick Barrett of this parish, um, uh, Richard Hastings um, from, uh, from Warwick, and uh, Kate Henderson, who's from uh, London School of Economics, who's, who's looking at the uh, health e economic side, side, of, side of this. So a little bit about what we're doing in the project. But anyway, let's crack on um, and talk about the content is what I'm going to run through is definition of well-being, why it's important, what the evidence is in relation to ID and staff, um, what supports and challenges there are to well-being, and then what we can do to promote well-being. Okay, so well-being was defined by Dodge, and he talked about this balance between resources and challenges. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and he talked about this being a seesaw. Um, where uh, you need to have balance between uh, the uh, psychological, social, and physical resources and the, uh, the challenges that are sort of being made. So if this is nice and evenly balanced, then you know, we can just be deemed to be in a state of well-being. However, if the uh, challenges outstrip the resources, then we, we have problems. Um, so that, that's quite nice. And uh, this is how we like to conceptualize this. Um, this you, know, you can't stop the waves, uh, but you can learn to surf. So basically, you know, we're, we're looking at providing surfing lessons for uh, staff in intellectual disability services. <clears throat> First time I gave this presentation I was in Brisbane in Australia. And it seemed to fit better there than it did in the UK, but there you go. So uh, this is what we're about surfing. So why is it important? Well, there are a number of reasons we have, we have a moral and legal responsibility for the welfare of employers. So that, I mean, that's, that's given a standard. And also what we'd expect to see if we had staff with a good state of well-being is uh, reduced sickness rates and staff turnover, because this, this is one of the ubiquitous problems in adult social care settings. Um, and we, we, we used, when I worked in the NHS, we used to talk about the um, Christmas decorations test, that a good service is where most of the staff know where the Christmas decorations are stored. So think about that. Okay, um, and it, but it's really important within the, within the context and framework of positive behavior support, uh, because, you know, we, we, most of you are probably like, like clever dick consultants that, that come along, tell people what to do. They don't do the real work, but the real work is carried out by these people that we call mediators, uh, get us, you know. These, these are people, these are direct support workers. So these, these are the people who are the real agents of a sort of behavioral change. And what we're hypothesizing is that they need to be in a really pretty good state in order to do this. And uh, that if they have decreased states of well-being and an input upon their ability to do it. So, um, but, but behaviorally, um, I mean, there's no doubt that challenging behaviors can be aversive for staff. Um, if, if, if staff develop strategies uh, to, to make that behavior stop, then they're likely to reproduce those strategies, those strategies will be, uh, those behaviors will be re reinforced, negatively reinforced. So the challenging behavior of the individual will also be reinforced and maintained by what they do. Um, and what we're saying is that adopting positive strategies is likely in the initial periods to take more effort and resource. So when you're going into a situation that you believe needs to be, needs to be shifting and changing, um, that's going to take a sort of more resource and energy. And so staff who have uh, reasonable levels of well-being are more likely to have the necessary resource to be able to make these efforts and follow sort of PBS plan. So it's, it's absolutely vital there. And there are a range of studies that, that, have, um, that have argued those sorts of ideas and actually demonstrated uh, those principles empirically. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to talk about the challenges to, um, uh, to, to well-being um, and what resources sort of there might well be as well. Okay, so what are the challenges? Well, one of the obvious challenges is the notion of challenging behaviour. And indeed, you know, the early writings, um, many of them had the assumption that, that challenging behaviour produces stress. And, and was seen by many early sort of uh, theorists as, as actually um, one of its defining features. So you've got the example there of Eva Sarkoska and, and John Clements in 1996. But actually, if you look at the studies that are out there, there's not an obvious and simple direct relationship between challenging behaviour and, and well-being. And one of the be better of these, uh, well, no, no, I'll come on to that in a second. Um, when people have looked at this, um, when they've looked at, uh, um, you know, the, what, what states that, that people find themselves in, they use this concept of burnout, and it appears to be, uh, to, to have a good fit with uh, what we see in intellectual disability services. So it defines a state of physical, emotional, mental exhaustion that occurs when workers feel sort of overburdened by the demands of long-term involvement in emotionally demanding situations. So long-term involvement, emotionally demanding situations causes these, this sort of physical, emotional, mental exhaustion. Um, and I think we, we perhaps might recognise that as, as being at least uh, a danger and risk in relation to staff working in ID services. Um, so, you know, what are the, what are the obvious, um, uh, sort of what, you know, what, what's the, does the data say in relation to burnout and staff working in ID services? Well, Skir and Hatton published a review in 2006, which we've just updated, and uh, we're, we're analysing the data at the moment. So uh, you know, uh, you know, watch this space for what's happening currently. But at that time, um, they found that as the studies became more recent, uh, the burnout scores decreased. So something good was happening, and um, we don't know what that good was because this is correlational data. But one of the ideas would be that this this corresponded with the a movement of people from institutional care to community settings. So there is a fairly good argument there that that movement was not only good for uh, people living in services, but also good for people working in services as well. And the levels were less than would be expected in the general population. So you know, people working in ID services were actually less burnt out than people working in other industries. Well, that's, that's you know, Great news, but whenever I say this, people are really surprised. But why are you surprised? This is the area that you work in um, and you find it enjoyable because your behavior is maintained. You, know, you keep coming back to work. So, you know, there must be something in it for you. It wasn't specifically associated with challenging behaviors. Well, you know, one of the number of studies that have found this, the, the, the challenging behavior isn't the cause that we, we assume that it should be, uh, but it actually might be indirectly related and it might impact on people's responses to challenging behavior. And interesting, I, I can never understand, understand this, but it may be higher in workers with less direct contact with people with intellectual disabilities. So people that have less day-to-day -day contact are more burnt out. So what does that say is that all of you consultants, ologists, therapists, get off your backsides and spend some time with people with intellectual disabilities. Get out of the office, you know, it's good for you. That's what that data says. And there were certain personal variables that are predictive as well. Having a negative view of the organization, feeling uh, in need of great support from managers, and, and also this notion that you give more than you get back. These were sort of predictive factors that were sort of found in this. Okay, so a challenging behaviour is highlighted as a general pot potential stressor. The association between challenging behaviour and burnout is weak, and a number of studies have shown that. Um, responses may be different uh, in relation to aggression towards you as, as a person um, than challenging behaviour in particular. And also there's some evidence that the use of restraint produces more intense negative emotional reactions, and that's both for uh, service users and staff as well. So, um, you know, that, that's a potential, potentially sort of uh, a, a dangerous and risky situation. 
However, and this is the big message here, relationships with the organization and colleagues were more highly correlated with burnout than service user practice. And the conclusion that these two studies and work that we have come to is that characteristics of organizations rather than service users are more important influences on staff wellbeing. So the, you know, the conclusion that we've come to is that uh, fair enough challenging behavior is an issue but it's really how it's dealt with and how supported the, the, the individual member of staff is by their organization that, that is determining uh, the levels of burnout and uh, poor well-being uh, that they're experiencing. And the good news is that Burnout, poor well-being is not an inevitability of working with people with intellectual disabilities who produce challenging behaviour. So that's the good news. And the other good news is that if it's about organisational issues, these, these are things that are within our control. These are things that we can do something about. So we should be able to do this uh, so that, that people are, are better supported, have better well-being and thus live a better quality services. Right, time for coffee. A little word about trauma, um, and uh, this is some work that we've done where we decided to look at what is occurring in service through uh, an trauma-informed lens to see um, what, what might be out there. And we had a, a little study here where 130 members of staff were participants, and these were from nine different services, and these included education and adult social care and we ran a number of measures over them. Uh, one of them was the impact of event scale revised which is a standard measure of PTSD symptomatology. Um, uh, changing behaviour exposure measure just to check the, uh, the, the, the level of exposure that people had and also a, a bespoke questionnaire that we designed to measure the uh, extent to which people felt supported by their organisation. And then we specifically targeted people in these services that worked in the areas where there were highest reported incidents. Okay, so th these were people that you would expect to, uh, uh, you know, perhaps have, have, uh, uh, be experiencing difficulties. And what we found was quite alarming, really, that 69% um, uh, of these individuals were okay um, in relation to uh, you know, trauma symptomatology. However, um, nearly 11% were a clinical concern and a further uh, just over 20% were had very significant clinical concern in relation to PTSD. So you've got over 30% of the workforce at that particular time, so a cross-sectional study at that particular time that were experiencing active PTSD type symptomatology. Okay. A, a significant issue, a third of the workforce. I mean, you know, if we weren't being recorded, I'd, I'd say the F word at this point. You know, the, the, it, this is a big, big problem. We tried to tease this apart um, and there were no significant differences between sort of adult social care and education. So there, there, were, there was, it wasn't an adult social care or an education issue, it was across both services. There were differences in environments, um, and you can see this, you've got sort of an environment number five that was really uh, sort of very, very high, but it was nothing to do with adult social care. So it's, it's specific to environments and all of the factors that would be there in those environments. We looked at the relationship between how supportive people felt and those scores, and there were significant relationships between all of those. People that felt more supported were less likely to have higher PTSD symptomatology scores across the board. So that, that support was really vital. And what was, what was really important, well, I'll come, I'll come to this later, there was a significant difference between the, uh, the, the level of supportedness in adult social care and education. Okay, people in education generally felt more supported. And that doesn't surprise me really. Because when I go out to adult social care, it looks like the Wild West to me. Um, you know, I, 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 I get the impression that people 
are allowed to do whatever they want. Threat support workers are allowed to do whatever they want. People are just so grateful to get people into post that they don't want to upset them by telling them what to do. And that's very different, I think, in education. Education is very tightly run. And the idea as, as a teaching assistant or a teacher, you can go in and do whatever you want. I think that would never, ever be countenance. But it is a bit in adult social care. I know I exaggerate and I know I overgeneralize it, but I think that there's a problem there. Um, adult social care staff have poorer perceptions of organisational support um, and staff in educational uh, services perceive them are better able to cope with their role, more able to ask for extra help than required and better supported during and following incidents compared with staff in adult social care settings. Okay, so there's some indication that this is more of a problem in adult social care. And also, the, the relationship between trauma symptomatology and challenge your babies wasn't there. We only found it for one of the um, uh, challenge your baby exposure uh, types of topographies. Um, and we, we ran a number of correlations. We were bound to find one that was significant just by chance. This was the only one. So really, you know, the, the only significant relationship we found was this. Uh, so it isn't, it isn't the challenging behavior. It's, it's, the, it's what we do sort of organisationally. Um, and just, I, I, I've got a slide, I haven't got a slide to illustrate this, but the thing that people found most, uh, they, the area they found least supportive was in and around incidents. That was the big area that, that this is came out sort of time and time again, the scores around what happened around incidents was the, the thing that people said, this was the thing that we weren't doing very well. Uh, a very clear message there. So um, these trauma responses, um, they typically don't last long. So those people that we um, sampled in the study, um, you know, you could argue that, that what would happen within days and weeks, most of the people will feel sort of okay again. However, if, if the incidents keep occurring again, people are gonna be in like this washing machine um, and, uh, and, and, and keep you know, being re-traumatized. And we do know that one of the things that makes you liable to respond badly, as it were, to um, stimuli, to new events, is previous history of responding badly. So, you know, the, we, we could well be uh, in a, a, a vicious circle here. These are the sorts of responses that you would expect in relation to, to trauma. Uh, so we've got these psychological responses and I'm not gonna go through all of these, we don't have the time, but just you know, quickly scan these. Um, and then whilst you're doing that, think, well, what was the impact of a member of staff, a key mediator, somebody responsible for delivering positive behavior support? What would, what would be the influences of somebody having these sorts of uh, you know, psychological sort of uh, responses and physical responses. So not only is this something that happens inside of people's head, it happens in their whole body. You know, people are feeling visceral responses in relation to this. These are not things that you can shut off and ignore. You know, these are big time influences on you. And you know, for the applied behavioral analysts out there, you think that you can conceptualize these as a, motivating operation that's there you know in relation to that individual that's affecting their the uh, the power of reinforcers that are associated with caring behaviors and you know uh, you know it would have a huge influence and uh, uh, nick gore and i published a, a paper a few years ago in ijpbs where we made that argument about you know the the, uh, the the trauma and other sort of mental health difficulties you know being sort of motivating operations. Anyway, that's not the not the, to the topic for today. But you know, contact me directly if you you want to have those sorts of discussion. These are some of the incidents that people described. I, I guess I don't need to, to to describe them to you, but you know, the, 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 you can see. Right, let me talk you through. I was supporting actually two other members of staff. We had a good walk, but as we got near the house, we became anxious. There was a gentleman out walking his dog. Two members of staff had him in a two-person hold due to his behaviour, 
running off and there was a member of the public nearby. Um, he dropped to the ground and was sat cross-legged. Two members of staff were knelt beside him and had him in a hold. The gentleman walked past with his dog and he was let out of the hold, got up and started to hit towards myself and two other members of staff, put him in a hold again. I didn't move out of the way fast enough uh, to help him. The other two members of staff, which rolled in and kicked to my groin area. Okay, so all of the things that, that, that you would expect to be difficult, you've got restraint taking place there and you've got sort of aggression towards others. Really sadly, this goes on. Not knowing I was pregnant, I took a test and it showed positive, but then my monthly cycle started the day after the incident. I went to the doctors and I had cramps, very heavy bleeding, and a very high chance of miscarriage. Not only was this individual affected, but somebody who wasn't even there as well. This was the manager who decided, who'd, who'd planned for that day. I was required to do essential training, therefore not physically in attendance when the incident happened. Due to increase in challenging behaviour, one young man we support had his support hours increased to three to one in the community. I was on training that day and I had to attend, so I asked my supervisor to cover. Uh, she'd been trying for a baby for several months, but informed me that she thought she wasn't pregnant on this day. A uh, young man became anxious, was out on a walk and needed to be escorted back uh, as it was a risk to the public. Uh, whilst using uh, this restraint, my colleague managed to kick in the stomach and groin. The next morning, she went to a GP with stomach cramps, heavy bleeding, and diagnosed as having a miscarriage. Highly emotional time for myself, as well as her. I also felt guilty for asking her to cover this shift. There was no one else due to chronic and ongoing staff shortages, uh, which had been raised with serious management on multiple occasions. Both of these individuals were reporting uh, the, you know, the, the high symptomatology. Uh, that I alluded to earlier on. So, you know, what would be the implications? You know, and if we had time, you know, we, 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 we could start to talk about this, but quite clearly a major problem. Um, if you've got staff that are hypervigilant, uh, avoidant, you know, this, this is a significant problem and may well be one of the most significant problems that there is uh, in adult social care intellectual disability and challenging behaviour services. This, this may well be the reason why we go around and we, we struggle all of the time in terms of you know, introducing the really good sort of ideas that perhaps we can devise as consultants, but they fall on deaf ears in relation to uh, the, uh, the people that are actually doing the work and providing direct support for the individual. So, what resources are there out there? Well, Richard Hastings, um, uh, in a study 2002, identified a number of significant factors that there might be that would re lead to staff resilience, you know, to people being um, able to uh, perhaps cope and deal with uh, the, the, the challenges. And they talked about role ambiguity, role conflict, managerial support, individual coping strategies, and, indi and individual feelings of self-efficacy, this idea that you're in charge of yourself. And there's been, there's been a limited amount of search that have, have targeted these in, in terms of you know, producing sort of good outcomes. And one of those studies is by Basel Sotel that was uh, carried out in, um, in Australia. People have explored training um, uh, and you know, we, we had a really good exposition training sort of uh, earlier on in the day, but um, I, I don't know why I chose this particular study and uh, probably because of the high quality. Of it. Um, but we, we actually explored you know, variables which were not about, you know, um, have, have you had a nice couple of days sat with these lovely trainers? Um, we looked at uh, sort of attributional stuff um, that we would thought would be directly related to this, this idea of well-being. So, you know, there's, there's some evidence that, that, that training can be effective here, but, you know, beware that, you know, the, the, the training needs to be specifically designed to bring about these sorts of outcomes. It's not just about knowledge. Uh, you need to get in there and you need to be working uh, sort of an attributional level in relation to uh, you know, switching the way that people conceptualise both their role and uh, the people that they work with. Um, and there's also an emerging evidence base around uh, acceptance and mindfulness-based approaches. So, um, uh, you know, the, these are some of the studies. There's probably more studies that have occurred 
since then and what, what they showed is really sort of encouraging uh, sort of outcomes in relation to how people are feeling in terms of uh, you know, their own well-being but also the impact on challenging behavior as well but i think we've got a big problem with mindfulness based approaches and the way in which these are traditionally sold because i think we have a very skeptical direct support worker population who won't take kindly to having a half hour session contemplating a raisin is my opinion anyway let's move on after incident what happens well you know this is what we're told and, and you, you, this stuff around debriefing is is there it's ubiquitous every single document tells us that we should be debriefing so i'm going to run through those subliminally this is positive proactive workforce they talk about debriefing all the time uh, not all the time but frequently <laughs> let's not exaggerate um and the build code of practice talk about it um uh, the uh, uh, sort of uh, the reducing the need for restraint, physical intervention from the Department of Health guidance talks about it. Um, and also, every one of these talks about debriefing as if it was the emotional support of the member of staff and learning what we did as an organization uh, that caused the incident and how we could do that better. And they talk about doing these at the same time. And if you get nothing else out of my presentation today, don't do that. It's stupid. Okay. You, you are going to emotionally support someone by getting them to tell you what they did wrong to cause the incident. What planet are we on, you know? And that is, that is there right the way through this guidance. And I've been shouting about this for a few years now, and you notice that in the restraint reduction network stuff, they are not saying that anymore. And I take a bit of credit for that because I, I wrote the first one, uh, you know, in terms of sort of guidance, basically saying separate these two things out. They're both important. You need to learn, you need to support people, but don't expect to do it, you know, like in a, like a one size fits all at the same time. So what's the evidence base for debriefing? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, there isn't, you know, they, they, if you look at it, that the NICE and Cochrane say that we shouldn't do it. Okay, for individuals experiencing a traumatic event, the systematic provision to that individual alone, a brief single session intervention is often referred to as debriefing that focus on the traumatic incident should not be routine practice. Okay, this is the same NICE that produced the guidance that said that we should be debriefing people after uh, sort of incidents of aggression, etc. If only they'd wandered down the corridor to have a word with their mates in the PTSD office. Sorry However, to interrupt you, Peter. This is just your five-minute warning. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Well, you know, we're, we're doing all right. I'm, I'm rocking on. <laughs> um, this is for single session debriefing to treat trauma. Okay, but I, I don't, is, is that what we're doing in services? Well, if we are, well, then stop it, because clearly there's no evidence space to do that. Um, and it's also based on poor studies. And if I had the time, I would take you through those studies to demonstrate why that they were poor, but boy, were they poor. This is the latest document that's come out. This is a scoping review of early post-trauma trauma interventions in organisations. It was commissioned by Public Health England and had some input from the British Psychological Society and the College of Policing. And they are saying uh, that uh, there's room for us facilitating some sort of peer support mechanism uh, in relation to organisational trauma. Okay, so that's that's the latest uh, document that there is out there. We have been working with this package called Crit Critical Incident Stress Management, um, and this is what our uh, NIHR funded project is looking at. This is a, a package that focuses around uh, you know what we do around sort of incidents. Um, I'm not going to take you through these slides because I'm running out of time, but it's got four. Uh, sort of uh, parts to it 
And the bits that we're particularly interested in is this diffusing stuff, um, which is the stuff that you do immediately. Um, and it comes from good practice in a, an emergency services uh, of standing down. And it's how do we support people immediately? And this isn't like debriefing, sitting them down, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we're going to be providing uh, some adapted training to adult social care shift leaders and managers in how to do this. Um, and we believe it's a skilled job and it's about all these things about uh, you know, giving validation to the individual, making sure they're okay, detecting if there are signs that the person is going to be experiencing some more sort of impactful responses. And then also um, we're going to be looking at debriefing and when we debrief and how we debrief, because there is some evidence that, uh, that debriefing in a group context and only in a group context can be really sort of quite useful. And this is the, um, again, I don't have time to go through this, but this is what would usually happen in a debrief and it would be carried out um, two to four weeks after the incident. Uh, it would be carried out by two trained people and these people would be trained people. They, they wouldn't be, they would have specific training. Um, there's a little bit of evidence for this and a little bit of evidence that this was written by me. This was a, 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 a case study, it's one, one, a bit of the evidence, a case study that we that was conducted following a serious incident. Now this incident involved assault of other service users. It involved assaults carried out on members of staff. It involved a sort of ambiguity of where the support, senior support was coming from. It involved the individual themselves being taken to A&E because they lacerated their abdomen because they put themselves through a, 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 a glass door. So everything sort of went wrong here. Um, I offered to, because uh, I, I was trained in this uh, CISM sort of debriefing approach as part of my NHS responsibilities, and I offered to debrief this staff. And we can look here at the, um, these are, individual members of staff, so six people all together. And you can see that people, uh, uh, these two people here had, uh, you know, very high uh, PTSD symptomatology. These had a clinically concerning symptomatology and these two here had none or two. You can see that on follow-up, um, the people with the highest scores um, had the biggest effect. Um, and also everybody at follow-up was uh, in the, non-clinical concern, uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, had non-clinically concerning scores. Now that, not necessarily what I did, because we do know the passage of time causes that effect as well, but it was, it was encouraging evidence that, that this, this may well be useful in certain circumstances. Okay, so that's what you'd expect in a supportive education culture, as well as your organization culture. I'm going to leave you with um, Nick Gore and I's pyramid. Um, you know, we, we've stolen the school-wide positive behaviour support triangle and we stuck our own words in. So what we're arguing is that we need an organisation-wide positive uh, staff support strategy. And just as we do when we're supporting individuals, we want these universal supports in place. And these will be th things like uh, a clear role, uh, job descriptions, uh, trauma-informed, uh, training and induction, uh, supervision, uh, you know, acceptance of mindfulness-based practice within the workforce, management of PBS within a, um, a challenge of behaviour in a PBS framework, frequent consultation with staff about the support that they're receiving. So these things across, across the board. And then when there's difficult situations, we need to be exploring you know, what, how we handle these, these shift, these diffusion strategies is how we facilitate peer support because we know that peer support is the most uh, effective uh, practice, uh, informal peer support. And then finally, uh, for those people that we are identifying as being significantly affected, how are we uh, providing a response to them that is helpful? And these might include group diffusing, it might include group debriefing, uh, and also might include signposting to evidence-based psychological therapies, for instance, EMDR and CBT. Okay, so this, this is the thing that we're working with at the moment. 
in the project that we've got, the uh, funded project, we are focusing in the main on these targeted uh, secondary prevention strategies um, and where we're going to be rolling out. Uh, we're going to be uh, adapting existing models, sense testing the adaptations and then piloting those within a limited number of services to see uh, whether it's feasible uh, for, for running this. So we're going to be looking at how much it costs that doesn't fit with current structures to make sure you know, it really works. That's um, my uh, contact details.